Hey, and welcome back. This week's video will be a little bit different as compared to the usual. Those of you who follow me on Instagram will know that lately I've been doing a huge amount of glaze testing in order to find something new which I can add to my current palette of glazes. This video will be more like a journal entry. I'll discuss what I was searching for, how I went about doing it, and numerous other topics. Of course, this process begins with the creation of test tiles. This is the high iron stoneware clay body I've been using for a very long time. And one of the conditions I wanted for the new glazes is that they'd work equally well on both stoneware and porcelain. I throw my tiles on backs, like so, and then once they're leather hard, I simply cut them to size with an old sharp paint scraper. So before my last round of six reduction firings, I spent a day or so making a whole load of test tiles. I think about 200 or so in total, in both porcelain and stoneware, which I then bisque fired en masse, stacked in mugs and bowls. And it's on these tiles that I test the new glazes on. In hindsight though, I wish I had made even more. I got through 200 in about five firings, which is quite remarkable. And I was left with an unbelievable amount of new information, glaze and surface wise. I've been using the same couple of glazes for the last five years or so, occasionally switching out the stoneware clay body, as that actually makes a really big difference on the final appearance of the glaze itself. But generally I've just been using the same three, and I think it's really about time that I expand that. I think previously I had been so caught up in creating so many different shapes and forms that I was quite content having the same couple of simple surfaces to glaze my pots. So I think it's about time for something new. This next sequence simply goes over how I mix up one 100 gram batch of glaze. And I know I don't use a spoon or a scoop, but a flat metal edge, which I like as I can just tap it very lightly to cause a tiny amount to cascade off the side, as opposed to all the material being pulled in the basin of a spoon. That being said, using a flat edge like this does make transporting it from the bag of raw material to the small bucket far more precarious. But essentially, as I only want to test a very small sample of glaze, I only mix up 100 grams worth using a pair of scales that measures to two decimal points, so that I can be incredibly accurate when weighing out the material which is especially useful when weighing out very tiny amounts, such as the 0.2 grams of cobalt oxide, which I needed for this recipe. Once all the raw materials have been weighed out, I add some water and then give it a really thorough mix. And it's worth noting for this entire process, as I make glazes, I'm wearing a mask and I generally keep my studio really well ventilated with the doors open and the windows too. I'll then sieve this mixture and generally in terms of consistency, I try to make the mixed up glaze about the same consistency as double cream or if I were to dip a finger into it, I would want the glaze to coat it instead of it just flowing off. You'll find that some recipes online also give you the amount of water that needs to be added to the raw ingredients. But if you're mixing up custom glazes, it's often just a matter of trial and error to find the viscosity that works best for you. For the type of clays you're using, the thickness of your pots can make a difference too. And also just the overall look. Simply put, there are a lot of variables. And that sums up glazes quite well. There are quite literally infinite possibilities, combinations, and glaze recipes. So knowing where to begin can often be quite daunting. For most of my own glazes, I've slowly built up a recipe book over the past 10 years or so. From my time in school, in college in Ireland, some from my apprenticeship with Lisa Hammond in London, and then some from my time in Japan too. I barely use any of them, but what I do have is a good selection of bases from which to work from, which I can alter and adjust numerous times from firing to firing, like I'm doing here. I then carefully label each test tile with a string of letters and numbers which correspond to the written recipe in my glaze book. And essentially, I started out with about 25 different glaze bases 
which I then reduction fired in my gas kiln. Then, upon seeing the results, I would alter the recipes, make additions, subtractions, scrap glazes altogether, and test out entirely new ones. So, in my search for some new surfaces, I was really looking for a number of things. The first was a yellow crackle glaze to go alongside my greens and whites. Whilst doing that, I thought it's also worth just exploring and trying different colorants and additions to my usual crackle glaze just to see what happens. Then, a black and white to match one another and both contain quite a lot of depth. And finally, some more metallic glazes, both with and without manganese dioxide. Then, all that's left to do is place the test tiles alongside my glaze pots in the gas kiln and fire them. And it's worth noting, every single glaze you see in this video is reduction fired to cone 10, which means if they were instead fired in an electric kiln in an oxidized atmosphere, they'd look completely and utterly different. In this type of firing, where flames are jettisoned inside the kiln, you're able to alter the atmosphere so that there's barely no oxygen inside the chamber. This state of reduction causes the fuel inside to burn inefficiently as there simply isn't enough oxygen. And so, instead of finding the oxygen in the atmosphere itself, the pots and glazes are chemically changed as an oxygen molecule is stripped from an iron molecule contained in the clay and glaze, altering it and thus creating colours and textures which can be very difficult to reproduce without a reduction in atmosphere. It's a fascinating process, and you can even alter how heavily reduced the kiln is, which ultimately can change the end result of a glaze quite considerably. But once the kiln has been fired up to temperature, and it's given a few days to cool down, the contents can finally be unpacked, and they're always far more exciting to unpack when the load of pots also contains dozens of new glazed test tiles, as each one needs to be picked up and inspected. There's so much to see on each one, and you can usually tell at a glance whether it's been successful or not. Beyond visuals though, there's also the texture of the glaze. Some can be quite rough, others very smooth. Some are satin, some are silky, some are like eggshell. There's a vast variety when it comes to texture. And I think I more or less had some examples of everything, including those that became so fluid during the firing that they just ran off the tile and onto the kiln shelf. Here's a handful of them, two of which actually made the final selection, which I'll show in a lot more detail at the end of the video. As one batch of results came out of the kiln, I'd identify which tiles I liked most, and then I'd see if I could alter those in any way, such as adding more red iron oxide, which creates more of a green hue, but in combination with titanium dioxide, it tends to make the glazes turn more yellow. And this is essentially how I did it, iteration after iteration. And whilst I did ultimately find a handful of glazes I really liked, there were also those along the way which I really didn't like or simply just failed. And here they are, all of the glaze tests. I think this might be the most thorough glaze testing I've ever done, and it really did take hours to document them, and to sort through them, and to find the ones that I was more attracted to. And previously, each board just symbolised which firing they were in. So before I could get to really selecting the ones I liked, I first categorised them all. The first group, is the yellow tests, which I'll admit it, I think I failed to get one that I truly like, but that might be due to the fact that getting a nice yellow in a reduction atmosphere is actually really difficult, especially on a high iron stoneware clay. This next group are all my crackle glaze alternatives, so that's taking my base recipe and altering it in small ways to see what differences I can get. Then this board is dedicated to all the blacks, metallics, and other similar glazes, be it by appearance or by recipe. And lastly, this board is just a mix of things, such as various different bases, lots of different whites, greens, and blues, many of which I actually really love, but I don't see them fitting into my glaze palette so much. And here they are, all grouped, ready to properly inspect and to select the final few, 
which I'll eventually use. But before I get started properly, I want to tell you what it is I'm searching for in a glaze, beyond just surface and colour. I'm looking for something more than just a plain, simple hue. I want depth in the glazes that I use. I want variation. I want subtleties to come through, be it iron speckles, a variety of different surface textures, such as being both matte and shiny. I suppose what I'm trying to avoid at all costs is just a simple, plain surface. These are my previous three glazes that I've been working with pretty much exclusively for the past six years or so. And what I love about them is the amount of depth they hold. There are layers in the crackles. There are speckles of iron. There's colour variation. And the glaze changes colour where it breaks over sharper edges. And as a surface, you can see just how much it changes when the light in the studio changes too. On to what's new. These three tests simply show what my crackle glazes look like, but on porcelain and it should give you a good idea of just how much the clay body underneath affects the glaze itself. And in my opinion, these crackle glazes work so much better when there's a high iron body underneath them. And after looking at these three, I don't think I'm too keen on the darkest, but the middle and the white aren't too bad. And I may start creating some porcelain work that's coated with those. I also took this opportunity to rework my current crackle glaze recipe. I upped the clay content a tiny amount, which seems to make it more stable, and I finally added bentonite to the base recipe, which means it won't settle quite so drastically in the bucket. I can't tell you how many iterations this glaze has been through, but it's a lot. So I'll begin by going over some of the crackle glaze alternatives I mixed up. Some are really lovely, but others I'll never touch again. And with these, I suppose I was ultimately looking for just something else to add to my trio of colours. And I think really out of all of these tests, there's only two or three which I may actually consider. This first one is simply the white base, but with an addition of 0.5% cobalt oxide. And whilst it is quite vivid and rather fantastic, I don't think it fits too much into my palette of colours. I know this cobalt colour seems to be rather trendy at the moment, but it simply isn't for me. It's incredible how potent cobalt oxide can be though. After this initial test, I dialed back the amount I used, and in doing so I was able to create some rather nice grey tones, such as this, which simply contains 0.1% cobalt oxide, which I like, and I like it on porcelain too. Perhaps the strangest crackle alternative was this one which again is just the base glaze, but this time with the addition of 4% rutile, which changes both texture and colour considerably. Rutile contains titanium dioxide and generally another mix of minerals, and it tends to affect the texture more so than anything else, creating these tiny streaks and a sort of mottled effect across the glaze's surface. In subsequent tests, I combined rutile with a lot of iron but in doing so, I ended up creating glazes that were incredibly fluid and simply ran all over the test tiles and the kiln shelf. Here are two more. On the right is the crackle, but with 1% rutile, and on the left is the base, but with 0.5% chrome oxide, both of which I really dislike and I won't be using. This black variant is once again the base, but with 3% black mason stain. And whilst the crackle effect does sort of get lost, once held up close, it does become more apparent. Although compared to the other glazes, it is more subtle. I was under the impression that mason stains, or stains in general, don't really survive reduction firings to high temperatures very well. And it seems while the black can withstand those temperatures, the yellow stain I have when fired to the same temperature is almost useless. And annoyingly, almost, the best yellow I was able to achieve was a total accident. This is just the base crackle recipe, but with 1% manganese dioxide, which isn't really a material I want to start using due to its toxicity, both when handling it and from the fumes it gives off during the firing. But if I ever do need a yellow for more decorative pieces, I have it, I suppose. Although, as you'll see throughout this video, yellows always look far better on porcelain and on stoneware they always end up looking a bit too brown for my liking. But it's funny that the best yellow test I got was completely unintentional when I did all these other tests that were purposeful 
and I did yield some really lovely tests, but whether or not I'll actually use them is another question. I ended up using a combination of both red iron oxide and titanium to get most of these yellow hues, which I added to various bases of my own and to bases that I found on the wonderful website glazy.org, which I'll leave a link to down in the description below. I ended up with a multitude of tests like this, which were yellow, but they were a bit dull. In general, I was using about 0.5 to 1.5, both red iron oxide and titanium to achieve these colors. One of the best ones I was able to get was this one, which is the incredibly simple 25-25-25 recipe with a simple addition of 1.5% titanium and 0.5% red iron oxide which gave me a wonderful yellow, especially on porcelain, and perhaps on a more white stoneware clay body, it might look quite good too. This next one is the exact same recipe, but with 0.5% more red iron oxide, which begins to sort of take away from the vibrancy that the yellow had before. This is another version of my base crackle glaze, but with the same addition of colorants as the previous tests, so titanium and red iron. And whilst I do like what it does on the edges, where the darker black border begins to appear. Overall, it's just far too brown for me. Brown pots aren't something I really want to make, but it was a good test to do nonetheless, as even a failed test still provides you with a wealth of information. Here's another test which, colour-wise, is rather amazing, and the stoneware version also has these crystals that grow, but it was far too fluid due to the insane amount of red iron oxide and rutile it contains. This one's interesting too. I'm not so fond of the blue that seeps down with the yellow, but the tone of yellow sort of hidden behind it is really quite lovely. And on porcelain, it looks even better as those blue streaks sort of fade into a thick, very dark, almost black yellow, but it's incredibly smooth. And I like how transparent it is, as you can really see the clay body underneath, the throwing lines, the trimming marks, the glaze sort of exaggerates the marks left by the maker. And here's another example of a yellow glaze that looks far better on porcelain than it does stoneware. It's very matte and feels great, although it does move an awful lot. I'm not so keen on how it looks on stoneware, but on porcelain it's really rather fantastic. And it does have that depth I'm looking for, that mottled surface with various colours that move and flow together. But if I do use this, I certainly need to do more tests to try and make it more stable, which you'd think it would be as it does contain 30% china clay already. So that's the yellows. I could show all of them, but this video would end up being really long. The next few are just a few bases, which I tested and really liked, although may not use. This is the classic Greenwich House matte base, but with 1% red iron oxide and titanium dioxide again to try and get something that resembles a yellow. But instead I ended up with this, which has quite an amazing texture and surface, but where it pools, it boils and creates these little sharp bubbles. These next three are based from an amber celadon by Alfred's Grinding Room on Glazy, who not only has the most beautiful tiles, but a incredible collection of glazes too. I altered the clay content considerably and essentially tested different colorants from left to right although this green in the middle is coloured simply from the red art clay. Whilst this one on the left is with 3% black iron oxide added, and on the right, once again, is iron and titanium. Now let's move on to my favourite batch of glazes, the plaques and metallics. Some of these are just incredible, but I don't see myself realistically using them. I'm happy enough knowing that I found one black that I'm really fond of, but there were also a few other little surprises along the way, such as this recipe, which contains a lot of Nephilim cyanite, a huge amount of manganese dioxide, and a touch of red iron oxide. The surface is incredible. These specks, these crystals really shimmer in the light, but due to the manganese content, I don't really want to use them, and they certainly wouldn't work functionally. This next one is the exact same recipe, but I increased the clay content by 20%, which made the brown stronger, but also caused the crystals to grow in smaller little specks. So I can't imagine these getting much use, but they are very pretty tiles. Like these ones too, 
which again I can't really use because of the manganese content, but it feels incredible and is so shimmery and metallic. And as it flows, it creates these interesting streaks. There is one last test I want to do with this, where I apply it very thinly onto a textile to see if I can avoid the streaking and instead have a simply flat, very metallic surface, which I then may use for more decorative pieces as opposed to functional wear. I also spent some time making some temakus and testing various recipes, as having a bulletproof one in your collection is always useful if you're reduction firing. These surfaces are incredible really, and up close they feel like mirrors. They shimmer and catch the light and break to wonderful red-brown edges where the clay is sharp. In the past, I've always used this temaku recipe, which I got during my time in Thomastown, where I studied ceramics for two years, and it's a lovely, very simple recipe, although it utilised Cornish stone, which used to be readily available. So instead, I made a new one, which again utilises the classic 25-25-25-25 recipe, with 10% red iron oxide, and I also tested this same glaze but with cobalt, only a really tiny amount but it did seem to make the black feel just that bit more rich. And in the right light, it flashes a very iridescent sort of dark navy color. Next are the glazes, which I should hopefully start using. This one is a simple mix of feldspar, whiting, china clay, and flint with a tiny amount of black iron oxide and a minuscule amount of cobalt. And it feels like this one will be all about getting the application right as the area I like the most is towards the bottom of this tile, where it's thinner and where the green hues haven't started to appear. It feels like metal and is wonderfully smooth. And on porcelain too, it's even nicer. It's also very stable and barely runs whatsoever, which is very useful, although I do think it's going to take some time to learn what the best viscosity is for this glaze. And as you can see up close, the surface is mottled. There are various subtle, colours and tones, and the matte surface is really quite lovely too. The third test tile you see here on the right was just a very thin wash, but you can see the difference it makes, and it's that sort of messy surface which I need to avoid. The next is a red which I really didn't expect to like, but I really do, especially on the stoneware, as it isn't quite so vivid, and I can see it matching the white and black quite nicely. The red hue in this instance just comes from about 12% red iron oxide. And this is another glaze that has a wonderful feel. It's so smooth and the surface again is slightly mottled with other specks of black and grey. It also appears to be a bit more shiny on the porcelain, but it's certainly usable. And that's a factor I wanted with all these new glazes, is that they needed to be usable on both porcelain and stoneware. The next two glazes have the same base which feels metallic, but is also scattered with these matte specks. This one contains black stain, titanium dioxide, and a minuscule amount of chrome oxide. And whilst it doesn't come across in this video particularly well, this glaze has a very subtle blue tone to it, and the surface feels like a pebble, almost, the kind that is soaked by the sea and is vivid in colour. But I just love how it sort of does two things at once. It's both matte and shiny at the same time, and it feels like a metallic glaze without containing anything that's toxic. And they are both remarkably similar on both stoneware and porcelain. And this one, which is actually basically the same glaze, I mixed accidentally, replacing the black stain with red iron oxide, which was a total error, but it caused something rather amazing to happen. It's both glassy and matte, and has a rich, red-brown undertone, like rust. It shimmers and is iridescent. It does have a few pinholes, which I'll try to resolve, but, but in the grand scheme of things, a few little specks like that really don't bother me. And I especially like how this glaze flows into a thicker band towards the base, which should look really good on a bowl form. And lastly, there's the blacks which have a very simple matte surface. And pretty much from left to right here, they just contain different feldspars, different types of clay and varying levels of black stain and titanium dioxide. This one, which contains triple F feldspar, for some reason has huge cracks running throughout it, with the glaze literally peeling off 
otherwise they're all very similar, although number four, which I particularly like, does contain some red art clay, which is also coated on the bigger tile here as an ever so slightly more metallic surface, and it's another glaze that feels wonderful and matches a white that I've made particularly well, as I think you need to have a really good black and white that work well together. This is the one though, I think. Once again, it's mottled with various tones and textures throughout. And with that, I think I have my final selection of glazes with this white too. I have no doubt either that these will change over time as I continue firing and I continue testing different iterations of each. For now though, I'll mix up larger batches of each and I'll glaze some actual pots with these selected few. I hope this video provided some insight into my testing process. And I think it's worth mentioning that I'm certainly not a chemist. I wish I did understand the chemistry behind everything a little bit more, but I continue to learn bit by bit as I go. Let me know which glazes you like most, and if you've got any name suggestions for the final few I selected, I'd love to hear them. Thanks so much for watching, if you made it all the way through, and I'll see you next week.